What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of career mode, this is episode number 209. And we start today's episode off with some player training, where as you can see Gonzalez right now at 85 over. You might have noticed when we signed him, his defensive stats aren't actually the best. And that is one common thing I'm noticing with youth players this year, that when you sign them, I should say youth players, new gens and regens I should say, but when you sign them and, and when you scout them, you, you take a look at their stats, they've got a decently high overall, yet their stats in the right kind of area for their position always seem comparatively low. You think about the amount of strikers we've had throughout the course of the series, such as Antonino Barai, for example, who's got a really good overall, a uh, really good natural rating, yet his finishing stat was always really low. And again, that is just something I'm noticing quite a bit. I don't know what causes that. I don't know why that's the case. But yeah, Gonzalez might be 85 overall, yet his defensive stats are more likely to be someone that's around 78, 79 overall. It's really weird, but the sooner we get those trained up, the sooner he'll be closing in on 90 overall and I can't wait to get to use this guy on a regular consistent basis. I am, I, I gotta say, at the size we made so far, I'm most excited about him. I think he's gonna be a really good player in our team. But it was a couple more sales there as well and also we had a bit there for Tadebo, our centre-half. Manchester United put a bit bid for the centre-back but we got no plans to sell him because as we know, we've got a lack of CB depth in this team this season. That is the one area of concern for us this year. We've got so many attackers ridiculous amount of midfielders but in terms of defenders we've actually only got two official center backs and those are Tadebo and the new man in Brian Gonzalez everyone else is gone and of course Nicholas Wilson is uh, well officially a left back by trade although we play him center back so of course we're not going to go down to just one center back remaining so uh, we say no to the Red Devils Still for the first game of today's episode on the back of the draw against Manchester United in the last game of Bramble Lane. We will take a Wolves here away at Molyneux. And, you know, I'm going to talk about sliders a little bit as the gameplay is going on. Although I will give you a bit of a commentary for it as well. And the first highlight coming to Wolves there. Good save by Sam Hill early. And then again, another flying save by the goalkeeper as it was still 0-0. But all the pressure coming from Wolves in the early stages. And from this corner, Joffre whips it in. And Sanderson with a bullet header. And I mean bullet. It. Puts it past Sam. It was fuming at his defenders, but to be honest, Sam, I don't think anyone could be complaining about this goal. Whipped into the centre and just one of those AI on ultimate crosses, which, as you guys have seen since the patch, are at times undefendable. I mean, the power of that header. Had Sam got touch on the ball, I think he would have broken his fingers. Absolutely ridiculous power. And uh, Wolves have the leveller after a very early spell of pressure. But uh, we only had really had one chance in the first half. That was Jaden Bogle's shot well saved there as it was still 1-0. But 20 minutes after the restart, Bogle does go on a run. Golden chance to get ourselves back on level terms. And again, we hadn't really played that well. Willick lets him go. Tuansby comes across. But it's a definite penalty, no doubt about it, as Bogle takes a tumble. But in the last two games against Manchester United, uh, who, of course, were the EFL Cup finalists and Europa League finalists we beat last season and in the top four last year as well. And against Roma, of course, the Champions League winners. You know, you saw him both of those games the AI at times were quite passive in the Roma game of course Mandragora was sent off right before the break they went down to 10 men and uh, obviously they, they would have to play a little bit more conservatively against our offense no doubt about that but you know the last two games against the big teams you saw they were playing quite passively but in this game here Wolves were really really assertive and really really aggressive and I've mentioned it so many times before but this is one of the key problems I've had if not the biggest problem I've had with the patch uh, which came in I think again I think it was January when EA made the big changes to the patch with ultimate difficulty being stepped up like tenfold and um, it, it really is just so frustrating how in these sort of games here and this is no disrespect to Wolves whatsoever but last season they finished in the bottom half of the table these are the games where I'm struggling mightily in and in those games against the big teams, um, I wouldn't say winning with relative ease because against Manchester United, we actually only managed to get a point. But, you know, we're not feeling that much pressure. It just feels like these are the sort of games where it's just set up in order for you to lose. And with 10 minutes to go, you know, as we know, Sam Hill, amazing goalkeeper as we've seen since we came back here. Some of the saves he's pulled off, including in this game, have been remarkable. But I've mentioned this before, AI crosses on Ultimate are almost at times undefended when it feels like the game basically just lets the AI score. I, as I mentioned before, I, I never come out for crosses with a goalkeeper naturally. I will bring the goalkeeper out of the box for balls over the top, but never for a cross into the box. Sam just wanders out of his goal, watches the ball go over his head, and it's headed in, and Wolves win the game by two goals to one. And I've mentioned this many times before. Since the patch back in January, it just feels like goalkeepers are instructed to basically hit the self-destruct button at times. 
and allow the AI to get easy goals, like in the case of that one there. Just so, so frustrating. And again, I don't, I don't really want to have to do this, but what I am thinking about in future episodes is going back to how I did things with Bayer Leverkusen, and that is adjusting sliders on a game-by-game -game basis. Because to start the season off, I kept the sliders on 50 for every single game, but it's just, it's just getting a bit ridiculous now. Like I said, in the big games, the AI are just really passive. They basically roll over and just let you get as many shots in as possible, and they barely come forward and put you under pressure. But in games like that, you know, again, no disrespect to Wolves, but last season they were bottom half of the table side. You know, I just literally could not stop them. And the two goals they scored were almost undefendable. So, yeah, I think what I'm going to do is go back to the old way of doing it, adjusting sliders on a game-by-game -game basis. I don't want to because it takes a lot of time, and, of course, it means that the gameplay is going to change a little bit from here and there. But it's just the only way I can think of to stop the, uh, the AI from doing these ridiculous things from time to time. And also having games like that one, which are a lot more, you know, sort of realistic as opposed to getting absolutely dominated. And then in the big games, like I said, I also want realistic challenges in the big games as well. I'm even thinking about in the bigger games, like the cup finals and the games against the big teams, actually adjusting the sliders and giving the AI a bit of an advantage. Because when I play on 50, I feel like it's sort of set up in order for me to win. Anyway, uh, following that, as you can see, I had a bit four good bells, which of course we turned down from West Ham. And also it was time to bring... One of the old fans' favourites back to Bramwell Lane as well. Yes, you know his name, Scott the Block, Scott McKenna. Of course, as I mentioned in the uh, the game there against Wolves, you know we only have two official centre backs in this team. There is a lack of centre back depth in this side, including full back depth as well. And as I mentioned before, we brought Dean back. I want to bring back some of the players that we signed in their early to mid twenties back in the early seasons of this save, but bring them back now as they're now in their either early thirties or late twenties as dressing room leaders to mentor the young lads. Scott McKenna is in and you know, we signed Brian Gonzalez. As I said he's an old school tough as nail centre half but he's still quite a young man at 24 years old. Who's he going to learn from? Scott McKenna. Yes, former club captain Scott the Block is back at Sheffield United and I'm so happy to have him back. There was 22.5 mil from Watford Plus a 15% sell on clause which really is redundant because we're not going to sell him of course. He's going to stay here till he retires but McKenna with the 99 strength the leadership trait his physical uh, sort of rating as an overall collection of attributes is 94 94 medium high work rate six foot two and of course when he got the nickname scott the block that was because when we signed him if you remember in the first season we signed him to plug the gaps in our leaky back line and he actually did really really well he shored up our back line so well in the first couple of seasons and he, he was just someone that just seemed to throw his body in the way of every single shot real old school center half tough as nails really brave and uh, that's what we need here. If, if we're going to defend those undefendable corners against the AI, we're going to need an old school centre half like Scott McKenna who takes nothing, absolutely nothing thrown at him and just stand up to every single task. So yeah, McKenna, welcome back. And um, I just, I had to bring him back, man. You know, I want to bring back some of the fans' favourites. We brought back Dean. And of course, we brought the boys back as well. Uh, Ize has come back, and I also want to bring Scott back as well. So McKenna is back, and he's going to wear a captain's armband in his second debut for the club as well. As we, uh, we take on Chelsea here, away in the EFL Cup second round, away at Stamford Bridge. So taking on Frank Lampard's side, as we know, we've got such a, an amazing rivalry uh, with Chelsea, and we have done throughout the course of this series. But of course, in the EFL Cup, as I mentioned before, whilst we are the holders of this competition, it's always my lowest priority. Last season it was a little bit different because of course I wanted to win my first domestic honour with the Blades. We did that by winning this competition but back to normal service this season, back to fielding weekend sides. We've got to win the treble this season and the EFL Cup is not included in that list. So yeah, I'm fine fielding a weekend side and whatever happens, happens. So away at Stamford Bridge with a weekend lineup. However, we started the game off strong. We hit the post early through Morelos and then Good Bells would open the scoring and make it 1-0. I love the celebration there as well where he ran just past the camera so he had a really nice angle of him just dapping the fans there in the away and that looks so cool didn't it as uh, the blades go in front and really in the first half it was all Sheffield United despite fielding a weak inside we were the far superior side but again like I mentioned earlier against Wolves I wasn't really that surprised and when Chelsea went down to 10 men here for a cynical challenge by Juan Miranda this to me I think it was a straight red card it was a really really bad challenge from behind no doubt about that very late as well certainly a straight red card but there was no need to do it and again just one of those moments where I'm playing the game I drop the controller and I think to myself it just feels like the AI wants me to win this game you know having said that four minutes after the restart 10 men Chelsea would find their leveler so maybe not right Zakaria uh, latching onto a free wall there and drilling it past Dean in the goal making it 1-1 and giving Frank Lampard's side the equaliser so Chelsea won Sheffield United won 
But in the 53rd minute, I was getting quite frustrated at this point because we hit the post for the third time in the game. Gravel's there, latching onto a free kick, his free header off the woodwork as it was still 1-1 three times in the game. We'd hit the woodwork here. Just couldn't find that second goal to get back in front, which we deserved, really, as Portia makes a really good stop there. And it's still 1-1. And in the dying seconds of the game, a golden chance for Chelsea to win against the run of play. Pasalic plays a 1-2 of Lautaro Martinez, takes aim from just outside the area. And oh, my goodness. I thought that went in, and so did Frank Lampard. Ripples a shot on an air side than that, just outside the, um, the frame of the goal. I thought it actually gone in and snuck it in the near post. Thankfully, it went the wrong side of Dean's left-hand post. So, yeah, final score, Chelsea won. Sheffield United watch when we would go to a penalty shootout. And after the, after the bizarre shootout you saw in the Europa League final last season against Manchester United, well, watch what happens here. Uh, just like against uh, Manchester United in the EFL Cup final, uh, Chelsea picked their worst five penalty kick takers first. And if you remember, in the Europa League final against Manchester United, I didn't figure it out until the first three or four penalties. But Manchester United went to the same side every single time, which was our left-hand side. And watch what happens in this shootout. You've seen two go to that side. Ake stands up next. And where does he go? He goes to the same side again. And at this point, I'd already figured it out. All I had to do with Dean Henderson was just keep flicking the stick to his left-hand side. And we will keep on making the saves. Chelsea have gone the same way each time. Each time, Dean have pulled off the heroics. And then for this fourth penalty, where do you think Pasalic is going? Well, look where I placed Dean. I knew exactly where he was going. To that side again. I think penalties are broken. And again, I'm going to say this once again as I show respect here. I don't really know why. I'm going to say this once again. I think EA have done this on purpose, man. They are trying to suck the life out of career mode players by doing these things here. It's not a bug. It's not a glitch. This isn't an accident. They've done this on purpose. They are trying to stop you from playing this game mode and trying to turn you away from it. Suck any kind of enjoyment out of it. This is not a bug. This is not a glitch. This is done on purpose. The AI picked the worst five penalty kick takers and they go to the same side every single time it's not a coincidence no team is going to place the shot the same way nine times out of nine i think it will be now when you count the europa league final penalties as well and they're not going to pick the same worst five every single time as well penalty shootouts are broken and again i think yeah i've done this on purpose i you know i'm thinking about doing a, a video in uh, in the near future where i just talk about the conspiracy theory that i have if you will and list all the things that ea have done to career mode over the past couple of years that seem like they've done it on purpose to ruin the game mode i don't know if you guys would want to watch that if you would then leave me a comment or drop me a tweet i'm happy to make one but um yeah it's just getting a bit frustrating now it, it just seems so obvious ea are trying to ruin this game mode on purpose but uh, anyway, guys, that was this episode of Career Motor. A big thank you for watching. If you have enjoyed it, if you did enjoy this episode, please drop a like. Much love to you. You all have a fantastic day. And I'll see you for the next episode of Career Motor featuring Transfer Deadline Day very soon.